Well, yeah, we can get started. I'll uh, start us out with some prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this day and everything you've provided for us. Um, yeah, thank you uh, for the sun and just how everything you've made is so beautiful and you know fantastic. But at the same time, um, something you know that uh, that you know we can't do. Uh, so once again, thank you for who you are, um, for the truth of Jesus Christ, how you came down on this earth, died, and was uh, rose again, and uh, the forgiveness of sins that you provide. Pray that uh, we'll learn a lot and just have good good discussion. We love you, and in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Cool. All right. Um, so, oh, you're doing intro. Go for it. Sure, yeah. So, this week we're going over the Apocrypha. Um, Apocrypha, as a term, generally just means good teaching with dubious authenticity. <laughs> uh, so, um, only in recent times has it come to mean something that's, like, heretical, mm -hmm. uh, which it's never really historically been used to mean and uh, yeah there's a lot of different views on this actually throughout the world and Christianity uh, there's actually quite a few different views in terms of uh, Catholic or the Orthodox it, depending on which Orthodox you're talking about Eastern Orthodox or Greek Orthodox mm -hmm. um, they all have different canons so this class is going to focus on uh, the Catholic view of the doctrine of the Bible or canon of the Bible <laughs> and also um, go over reasons why Protestants don't hold the same view. So. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, we're going to kind of do the same approach that we've been doing. Cal's going to take the Catholic view, and yeah. I'm going to take the Protestant view. Um, we're going to the, swap the order this time, though, because it makes more sense to do the Catholic view first, because ours is more of a negation of that. Yeah. Um, like you know what I mean? Like they they claim it is in there, so it's kind of the burden of proof falls on us to be like, well, we don't think it should. So yep. um, just kind of makes more sense that way. Um, to do a quick recap, uh, this is probably going to be our last week of doing Catholicism. Um, so we went through um, communion, transubstantiation, or um, transubstantiation. Sub yeah, <laughs> that one, the Eucharist, um, and then <laughs> faith versus works and baptism, water baptism. So. Like we said, the main difference falls in the difference between justification versus sanctification. We've kind of beat that horse to death. Um, and then really the, the practical difference between Catholicism and uh, Protestantism, if you could break it out in like one phrase, is faith versus works, right? So yeah. um, they believe it's a works-based one. We believe it's a faith-based one. And we'll even start to see that interplays into the Apocrypha here today. It's actually one of the main reasons why they hold to the Apocrypha. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I thought this would be a good thing to talk about too, though, when we start talking about canon, because it's actually a huge topic. I mean, everybody, I feel like everyone in the world has an idea of what should be included in the Bible with the canon. Yeah. Um, but I think this is a, the most important verse we need to go to before we start talking about that. It's 1 Corinthians 2.14. It says, those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of God's spirit, for they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So. Um, really important verse when you're talking about theology with anyone, um, is that it's not even possible for unbelievers to even discern spiritual matters, so we shouldn't really include them in the discussion. So um, I actually just read a few months ago, I listened to um, Richard Dawkins' uh, God Delusion, which is a really fascinating book if you uh, like, want to get the perspective of the new atheists um, on what they believe. But like when they, they talk about canon and the core beliefs of Christianity, I find it fascinating of how little they actually know about what we believe. You know, I mean, Richard Dawkins is just a really good doctor, and he doesn't know some of the basic things of our belief. And I think this is really why I think that it is a sanctifying act to understand the canon. But that being said, um, the Catholics, we should, at least for some of them, think that they are Christians. So if they come along and posit that, we think the canon should be different. We should heed that. You know what I mean? We should actually dig into it and figure out what they believe rather than just write them off as like, you know, like the Muslims will come in and say, John shouldn't be a part of the gospel. And we can just point to this first and say, well, we shouldn't really listen to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, whereas the Catholics, they do hold that weight. So it is an important discussion. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so going into the Catholic canon of the Bible. And so when we're talking about canon of the Bible, that is all all books that comprise what, say, Catholics believe are the Bible. Um, and uh, in particular, there's one really crucial aspect, which is the belief in the inspiration, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit on those particular books. 
Now, the Catholic canon uh, is pretty similar to ours. Uh, it includes all 66 books from the Protestant Bible, right? well, from, I, not Protestant Bible, from the Protestant canon mm -hmm. <laughs> of the Bible, and the New Testament is, is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest differences, however, are that the Catholic canon includes seven additional books and also chapters added to Esther and Daniel. Um, so there's like three different chapters added to Daniel and then like a couple of verses added to Esther and then an additional chapter added at the end to Esther. And uh, yeah, they call this uh, the Deuterocanonicals is what the Catholics call them. Uh, we generally call them Apocrypha. Uh, they've always been referred to as Apocrypha and it's more recently that the Catholic Church has really tried calling them Deuterocanonicals, which that term means second canon. So they believe the Deuterocanonicals are inspired by the Holy Spirit, just as the rest of the Old Testament. Um, however, that these are from, most of these books were written in that uh, silent period. And so as a result, it's a sort of second canon added on to the Old Testament. Well, I, I was wondering, I was going to ask you this because I wasn't sure. Um, I thought Deuterocanon meant five. So, and then there's seven additional books. Do you know why that is? <laughs> it, 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 yeah, it literally just means second canon. It just means second canon. Yeah. Um, I believe instead of that being from Hebrew, a sort of weird transliteration uh, uh -huh. of that same idea. Okay. Well, so no, so like we call it the Pentateuch, actually. So, yeah. It, yeah. Oh, wait, you're right. Yeah. So yeah, Pentateuch is five, five you're right. different languages. Like you're right. Yeah. And more Latin versus Hebrew Greek. <laughs> yeah. I can hear the duo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they just add some weird, funny stuff. But yeah, and uh, yeah. So historically, though, these books have always been considered, at the very least, apocrypha, meaning yeah. that they generally contain good teachings. However, the authenticity of them is dubious. Up to um, yeah. And so the primary reason why uh, Catholics do include these in their uh, Bible is because it's included in the Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint is uh, kind of an interesting uh, set of documents, but essentially the gist is that Aristotle, one of the teachers of the uh, Catholic Church that they hold up as an authorized teacher, He's known as a doctor of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, he believed that the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew um, <laughs> Old Testament, he believed that that was inspired by the Holy Spirit, in addition to the Hebrew also being inspired. So it, it might um, bring back some ideas, if you've ever heard of KJV onlyism, the idea that the King James Version translation of the Bible is the only valid English translation of the Bible. They believe that the King James Version is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, and Aristotle had a similar sort of view about the Septuagint. And so that's where, because these books are found in the most complete versions of the Septuagint, uh, you end up with that argument. So, yeah, it's... Uh, and, sorry. Am I remembering correctly the Septuagint was the version available to the Apostles? So, yes, that, that is a claim, as they say that the Septuagint was the version of the Bible that the apostles and Jesus was using during his time, uh, because they would claim that they didn't know how to read and write Hebrew, but they did know how to read and write Greek, and so therefore they would use the Greek version. Um, and then additional extra arguments that they would say is like, one, you know, do you trust the word of the Catholic Church? Mm -hmm. Or because uh, part a, a lot of the contention here is around, do, did the Jews believe that the, uh, the, the seven extra books, did they believe they were inspired or not? Um, there's a lot of contention around there, particularly the Jews of Jesus' time believe that. And what many Catholics would claim is that we don't really know what Jews during Jesus' time believed. We think they used the Septuagint. And that Jews after Jesus' time then came and uh, started making up rules that were different from what... Uh, Just a quick thing, if you're reading through the New Testament and you read like a verse quoted from the Old Testament, have you ever noticed how sometimes if you go back to the Old Testament, the words are just a little different? Yeah. Well, they're quoting in the New Testament from the Greek, the Septuagint, most yeah. often. And yeah. so that's why if you go back to the Old Good Testament, point. it's just a little bit different. Yeah. Oh, another clarifying thing. I think you said Aristotle. You mean? Oh, sorry. Augustine. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. Augustine. Sorry. Not. Yeah. yeah. No. Totally different people. <laughs> Augustine. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. yeah. I meant. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I meant, yeah, I meant Augustine, yeah. sorry. <laughs> and then, um, and, you know, so that's, that's uh, another aspect. And then, um, and for another quick yeah. question, sorry. Uh, how long have the Catholics had those extra books in there? That's a great question. So, from the time, so it's one of those things where, as far as the Catholic Church is concerned, the first real complete Bible that they put together is the Vulgate, which is Latin. Yeah. And that included the Septuagint. Okay. Now, before that, you have all sorts of mixtures of partial translations of things. So you have partial translations of books from the Septuagint into Latin. You have translations from, obviously, New Testament into Latin, etc. And those were never really compiled. Mm -hmm. Jerome, uh, around the time of Augustine, of course, comes through and he's tasked with building this Latin translation of the Bible. And what he does is instead of deciding to use the Septuagint as his basis for the Old Testament, he uses the Hebrew, whatever Hebrew sources he can find. And um, he actually writes a bunch of prefaces. So every book has like yeah. a preface talking about stuff. And for every single one of the Apocrypha, he notes how the Hebrews at his time did not believe that they were inspired. Um, but he kept them in because he was pressured by Augustine. Yeah, and um, he actually and personally it, believed that it was not a part of the Bible. Yeah, so it's Jerome. really kind of weird. Jerome is kind of an interesting character because it seems that at the beginning, as he was doing this compilation, he was more divisive about that, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then as he went along, it just kind of threw it to the side. So uh, many people will claim that, oh, Jerome actually believed that they were inspired by yeah. the end of his time or whatever, but who knows about that? Does Jesus but, or the Apostle ever... Well, anything from the Apocrypha? So the answer to that is no. Uh, none of the old, sorry, none of the New Testament quotes any of the Apocrypha. However, that can't necessarily be considered reason to exclude them because there are Bibles that we consider in the Old Testament that are also not quoted. Yeah, it is, it is a good point, though. I'll, yeah. I'll get to that when I talk about the Protestant view. Just a quick uh, update on um, Corey there. For the Catholic Church, a lot of like different areas, you know, some of them included and some of them didn't include it for a while. So mm -hmm. it's kind of yeah. ambiguous mm -hmm. until officially the Council of Trent, I believe 1523, yeah. when they decided everyone who's Catholic has to have the Apocrypha in the Bible. It's actually uh, 1545, but yeah, cool. So. <laughs> so that would have been yeah. a response to the Reformation, yes. who explicitly, they all explicitly yeah. rejected it, 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 it. Exactly. And so, as far as the Council of Trent, that is then. See, I don't know if their official position ever changed, so to speak, over time, but definitely how it practiced. In practice and publication, it changed yeah. over time, for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into all the dates and the reasons for that in a second, too, so hopefully. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so here's a note on the Septuagint. It's an ancient Greek <coughs> translation of the Old Testament. Uh, Jewish tradition, so modern Jewish tradition, holds that uh, the then Pharaoh of Egypt, Greek Pharaoh of Egypt, Ptolemy II, so remember how Alexander the Great went and conquered basically everything, and then he died and his kingdom was split into four pieces. You have the Eastern Empire, the Western Empire, Northern Empire, and Southern Empire. Ptolemy inherited that southern empire, and then his son, I believe, Ptolemy II, um, then uh, became pharaoh of Egypt. And the story goes that he was uh, really into local culture and religion, and he wanted uh, books, holy books, from these people that he could read himself. And so the Jews were one of those people that were mostly kind of sort of under his direction. There's actually some wars like Daniel actually has a prophecy of a war between the southern uh, kingdom and then the northern kingdom that is like scarily accurate and uh, so then he decreed that 72 Jewish uh, translators who knew both Hebrew and Greek be sent all to their own separate rooms to translate the entire Old Testament and when they came back they compared them and they were exact word for word that's legend I don't know the history to that the, what we do know is that Ptolemy is the reason why the Septuagint it was me. <laughs> um, as far as what we have, we do have some manuscripts dating to the second century BC. However, the most complete versions of these manuscripts, so it's not really like a single man, anyway, it's complicated. When they were found, there's an Alexandria copy and then there's a different copy. Those actually date to the fifth century AD. So we have the most complete ver tr Greek translation of the Old Testament 
uh, around 5th century AD. We have fragments of, of it from the uh, before Christ era, and those fragments are like a uh, couple books of the prophets um, and such. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, when Jerome translated it, he decided to use the Hebrew that was available to him because he considered that to be the best source, uh, whereas Augustine um, wasn't particular. I don't think he way. actually knew Hebrew, Augustine, which is one of the Augustine um, didn't know Hebrew, yeah, and he kind of big barely knew Greek. Yeah. He didn't know Greek super well, but um, he believed that the Septuagint was inspired, and so because of that, uh, like I said, there's probably some contention around Jerome believing that the Hebrew was better. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we don't exactly know what, because um, once again, the time that Jerome is doing this around the fourth century, that is about when they would have those most available, those most complete manuscripts of the Septuagint. But it's difficult for us to know whether the Septuagint from before Jesus' time was exactly the same as the one that they had available. Because once again, Greek being very common in the, in the area, translations being made all the time, tr uh, copies being made all the time, it's difficult to track down. And the average person isn't reading any of this until printing press. Right. Until after the printing press. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, so only right around the Reformation. So. Yeah, the Gutenberg Bible, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, of course, the Septuagint, um, the ones that we're talking about, like the Alexandria manuscript, contains all the Old Testament plus the Apocrypha, and uh, Jews um, purportedly did not uh, believe that the Apocrypha were inspired. And so this is according to Jerome himself, who's probably the best source. He wrote a ton about this, oh, yeah. and so he's probably the best source really for knowing historian. what Hebrews believed about the Old Testament and the Apocrypha in particular. Um, however, once again, you have that like little needle. At the same time, none of the, what the Apocrypha says has sort of any bearing on modern Christian values. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so as a result, there's not a reason to include it or not include it based on the New Testament. Yeah, um, that's good what it And so there's no reason to believe that these Hebrews, if they did not consider it to be inspired, were doing so because they hated Christianity. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Isn't there some <clears throat> general acceptance from the Apocrypha, <clears throat> like the, the idea of um, angels were fallen and... Well, we're, not, we're saying there's no reason so, why Jews would fight us one way or the other on so it. So there are many books that are considered Apocrypha. Uh, the ones that the Catholic, uh, the, that are in the Catholic canon don't have anything like that. Like some people might consider the Book of Enoch to be Apocrypha. Um, but no one, uh, except like some Ethiopian church, believes that the Book of Enoch, for example, is canon, is inspired. Uh, I'll get to the, the main, there are doctrinal differences between the Catholics and us because of the Apocrypha. Yeah. And I'll get into those, but that's not necessarily what Cal is talking about. Yeah. Right it, it, we'll see when we get Exactly. So here is the list of Catholic Apocrypha. So you have seven books, and then you have additions to Esther and Daniel. So you have the uh, Book of Tobit, Judith, First and Second Maccabees, which is kind of interesting to me because there is a Third and Fourth Maccabees. Uh -huh. uh, the Book of the Wisdom of Solomon, uh, Sirach, which is also known as Ecclesiasticus. So depending on what Bible you, you know, what Catholic Bible you have, it might say Sirach or it might say Ecclesiasticus. Uh, Baruch, and then um, yeah, additions to Esther and Daniel. I have quick summaries on each one of those. Tobit's a novel that follows a man named Tobiah, so not actually named Tobit. Um, through his sufferings and how God healed him and leads him to a wife. Um, Judith is a book that follows a woman named Judith and how she was able to deliver the Jews from Nebuchadnezzar. First and Second Maccabees are books that document the struggles of the Jews during the silent period after Malachi. It includes many references to a man named Judas Maccabeus, or also known as Judas the Hammer, uh, who was their leader at the time. Uh, the Book of the Wisdom of Solomon, a book purportedly written by Solomon that includes more wise statements, kind of like Proverbs. Sirach, a book written by a, na a man named Yeshua, son of Eleazar, son of Sirah, that contains many wise statements, once again, just like Proverbs. Um, Baruch is a book about Jeremiah's chronicler. So you remember in Jeremiah, his, the person writing all this down is named Baruch. Uh, this book follows him through his journey and a bunch of the things and miracles he experienced. And then Esther, the Septuagint version of Esther, contains several extra chapters, which expand upon the story. It provides a little 
like if true, it would provide a little more context around the particular decrees that I believe was it Darius gave out. Um, oh no, I think Artaxerxes. Yeah, Artaxerxes. Yeah, and then uh, Daniel, the Septuagint version of Daniel includes several extra chapters and some verses. So it includes an expansion of the fiery furnace story uh, and to include a song of worship. Uh, um, and then a 13th chapter of Daniel known as Susanna and the Elders, where Daniel does some detective work to find out that two men are trying to blackmail a woman into having sexual relations with him. And then a 14th chapter of Daniel known as Bell and the Dragon, where Daniel once again super sleuths his way to finding out that the Brass, that a brass idol, which was believed to miraculously consume sacrifices, is in fact a front for corrupt priests. That's the one that the Protestants like to make fun of the most, is uh, <laughs> as that one. There's, yeah, so it, it is funny how, as I was reading through this, they're like, yeah, these are actually some of the earliest examples ever of detective stories. <laughs> 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 which I, I thought was super funny. Um, yeah, now I read all of these, and uh, the content in them doesn't change doctrine at all, really. The only one that uh, would maybe change some of your doctrine is Sirach, where it includes some, I guess you just call it like misogynistic statements, so let's just put it that way. Um, and uh, of them, though, my favorite is Wisdom, uh, because it really does feel like it's from Solomon, but once again, what we know about the history, where it came from, as of what we know now, it could not possibly have been written by Solomon. Like, the best manuscript that we have would come hundreds of years after. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then uh, there are, uh, of these, the one that is, sorry? Can I just read a quick excerpt from uh, Tobit? <laughs> sure. <laughs> so there's a few verses of Tobit. Um, so. That same night after I had buried a body, he returned home and washed himself, and then I went to sleep against the wall. My face was uncovered because of the heat. I did not see that there were sparrows on the wall of the courtyard, and as my eyes were open, the hot droppings from the sparrows fell into my eyes and formed a white film on my eyes. And then Love he continues it. that doctors <laughs> tried to smear some ointment in his eyes and yeah. he went blind. He was like blinded. <laughs> yeah, he was blinded, and then he was miraculously given his sight afterwards. <laughs> when when Ra Raphael, is it, is it Raphael, I believe, visits him and then restores his sight to him. So, yeah, there's definitely some interesting things, but once again, there's a lot of interesting things in the Old Testament proper. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> where is that situated? Uh, that's like what, chapter 2? No, I mean, like, well, like it's not at the end of that version that you got there. It's oh, so it's in the middle. Um, yeah. They, if you look at the Old Testament order of their canon, it's a little different too. So like Psalms would normally be in the middle of our Bibles. Mm -hmm. Psalms is at the end of their Old Testament. And then usually their editions are at the end as well. And yeah. then some of the historical books yeah. are out of Usually. Well, particularly if you get like a KJV with Apocrypha, the, those are all going to be at the end. I, um, on the website, uh, they listed them in order like around Esther. So like Tobit, Judith, and Baruch were all like not stories like Esther. Um, How do modern Jews feel about this, these books? Isn't so none of, no modern Jew considers any of these to be inspired. Okay. However, like a book like Maccabees, they might consider to be interesting <laughs> history. Yeah. Is um, actually Hanukkah, Hanukkah, Hanukkah. What, is it Hanukkah that comes out of oh, I don't Maccabees? Know. Uh, no, so Hanukkah is like the, um, the, uh, oh, what's it called? The menorah mm -hmm. is, uh, directly depicted in Leviticus when they're creating, uh, the, yeah, the stuff, so. some Jewish festival. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of festivals that are not, like, decreed specifically, like, in, uh, the Deuteronomy, for example, like, but there are some that are, so, um, <clears throat> And yeah, so probably the, I would say the most historically dubious of, the, of these is called Judith. Um, because at the very beginning, notice how I said uh, Judith, you know, saves the people against Nebuchadnezzar. Well, I didn't say where Judith says Nebuchadnezzar is from. It says he is from the uh, Assyrians, which is just false. Yeah, <laughs> um, And so Catholics, again, have to do some mental gymnastics around that and say it's not being literal. Um, or it's not really being historical, it's just telling a good story. Yeah. This I, is a real issue with historical narrative. When you're yeah, about it, the Old Testament, right? it, exactly. And particularly when we want to treat the rest of the Old Testament like that. So. Yeah, right. Um, 
yeah, so that's kind of a quick overview of the Catholic Apocrypha. Once again, um, if you like talk about Greek Orthodox, they believe in all of this plus like third and fourth Maccabees and like a couple extras. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I guess before we get into that, does anyone have any questions on clarification of the Apocrypha or anything like that? Or are you guys ready to go into a Protestant view? All right. So um, Protestant view of the Bible, the, 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 there's a few different ways that we could approach this. I think the best is just to talk about canon in general, about why we include the books that we do in canon. And then we should consider the Apocrypha after that. So first of all, I'm going to take this all from Grudem's Systematic Theology. Um, since all Protestants agree with that, there's nothing that we would really disagree with Grudem on this. Um, he thinks that this is a huge deal that we, we have to really get to the core of the issue is that if we misunderstand canon, the cost is really high, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me, if the Catholics are right, we're ignoring direct commandments of the will of God and excluding it from our Bible, which is a huge deal, right? And then if we're right, um, then the Catholics are essentially adding on to the Bible and uh, the curse is very clearly laid out for that at the end of Revelation, is that uh, all the trials and tribulations that come in Revelation will be applied to you if you add them to the Bible. And so, as far um, as that goes with the Catholic canon, the two most direct examples of those would be like the Book of Wisdom and the Book of Sirach, right? Uh, uh, because those are per, are given as like, these are good, not uh, w without yeah, context of like, only for the Israelites or only for whatever right, right. sort of thing. Um, so, so yeah, the... Um, but so there's a lot of we should consider them to be in the Bible. Like Cal pointed out, the one of the best things that we should talk about is what the Jews believe, like, which is what Corey is saying, is, um, is that something that they agree with. Because the core assumption that we're going to take with the Bible is that it's the living, breathing word of God, and that he would preserve it throughout the time of the church. right? So would he allow the Jews not to get this up until the time of Jesus when the church starts? Yeah, um, and that's I think a very key point is up until the time of Jesus. Yeah, because the Jews don't accept the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we need to moderate uh, the degree to which we trust their yeah. their view. Uh, Grudem says is that we should follow follow the true church basically along the line, which would include from Abraham all the way up through the Protestant church today, is what he would claim. So um, there's some good extra biblical text that we can use to to see this. Um, Interesting, I'm actually going to go right to the Apocrypha of, for why we shouldn't include the Apocrypha, is in um, First Maccabees, there's a story about an altar that is defiled, and the author says that someone has to come to, to undefile it. I don't really completely understand it, but he has to come with the authority of the old prophets to be able to write canon, basically. And um, the author of the Maccabees apparently doesn't have that himself, right? So seems like the, the author of the Maccabees is actually claiming that he's not a prophet and doesn't have the authority to write canon, um, which is quite interesting. And then also within 1 Maccabees uh, 9.27, he says that there would be a great tribulation in Israel, uh, the like of which has not come since the time of the prophets has ceased and appeared among them, which he just claims right there at the time of the prophets has ceased, right? So that would mean that we're not going to have canon during Maccabees. So um, that's probably some of the main reasons why the Jews would have excluded it. Josephus specifically was one of the great Jewish scholars, probably the best Jewish scholar of uh, like the first, second century, right? Wrote extensively on Jewish literature, and he really showed what the Jews of the first and second century believed. I mean, we use those writings for a lot of things. And um, he wrote that from Artaxerxes, as Cal was talking about in Esther, through the time of Jesus, that a complete history had been written of the Jewish, um, of the Jewish history, I guess. And does not deemed authoritative. So that history is the Apocrypha. He's talking about the Apocrypha of the time up to Jesus' time. And he said it's just, just flat out says it's not it's not canon. Yeah. Right. So and um, in that in that case like it makes sense. Because Baruch, for example, was dead during that time. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> he could not possibly have written or, you know, the book of Baruch. Uh -huh. And Josephus wasn't a believer. No, no, he's Jewish. In just explaining no. factually what he's observing from Jews, no. Right. Yeah. Well, so well, he he was a believer. He was a Jewish believer. Yeah. So yeah. he was he, a Jew. He was not a Christian. He's not a Christian. Yes. So yeah. as Christians, if we're trying to figure out what the Jews believed, he's like the perfect example for to go to. He's basically like the Jewish version of Jerome. We have like our great historian theologian. That's Jerome, and there's just like uh, Josephus, and he was. I mean, he's probably a better theologian than Jerome was even. He's a great theologian, or not theologian. Well, yeah. Jerome spent most of his time translating. <laughs> yeah. <that's right. laughs> 
Um, so, and then Jerome also said that there's a fixed number of old books in the Old Testament, and he said there's 22 of them, which is not the 36 books, that we, or 39 books that we say, but um, <laughs> those were commonly combined, and we know that, right? So, yeah. we so know which ones we're yeah. to. Yeah, uh, because um, that's another thing where Catholics will say is like, well, the Masoretic text wasn't solidified until like around 1000 AD, uh -huh. and uh, that has 22 books. But they combine a lot of things. So, for example, like First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings are all one book. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. One hundred percent. Yeah. So. Yeah. So um, then I'm going to just briefly touch on the New Testament. That's actually a lot harder <laughs> to talk about whether it should be included in canon or not. Um, and we could spend an entire class on that. But just real briefly, um, we think just as the old prophets came with the authority to write canon, and the reason they did that was with the signs that came with it, right? Mm -hmm. so, blatant signs of parting the Red Sea and these sorts of things that nobody could say is not God. Um, and then they could speak on the authority of God once God had shown that the power of God is behind them. Right? The equivalent of that is the apostles in the New Testament. Yeah. So you have um, Peter and all the apostles that wrote um, in the Gospels, but then you also have like Luke and you have Paul right? that we need to talk about. Um, Paul specifically and Peter. Um, Peter says people will twist Paul's writings as they do the other scriptures, which that word for scripture is never used to talk about anything other than the Old Testament. So right there, Peter says all of Paul's writings is scripture, right? So he, he gives that level of authority there. Um, and then Paul actually quotes Luke um, one time, the, the book of Luke, not Acts, but the book of Luke, which would imply, and calls it scripture. He, he says that it is as it is written, um, which would imply that Luke is scripture as well, right? So we have all these kind of like puzzle pieces that they put together. Much more difficult conversation to have that we're not here to talk about. But, yeah, I mean, I will say as far as historical evidence for what we have for the New Testament mm -hmm. is far and away better than anything we ever have. That's certainly or true. Or ever yeah. have had. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, it is much better than even for the Old Testament sources that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and so as far as knowing what the New Testament says, knowing what people at the time, what Christians, what Jews, etc. thought about the New Testament, mm -hmm. um, it goes a long way for us helping solve that. Yep. And then additionally, because the New Testament, in particular the Gospels, have truth claims, they have things that we could falsify, uh, we could find that it was lying about something, mm -hmm. for example, but we're not able to, that in and of itself, like uh, Zach has said, the evidence for those miracles, particularly the miracle of Jesus' resurrection, mm -hmm. um, give us really, really good reason to believe that it's inspired. Yeah. But I, I think the most important one is that with the New Testament, as agreed upon throughout all of Christianity in general, of Christendom, yeah. we all agree what books should be in there. And that includes John and some of these ones that uh, secular scholars would, would uh, contend with. Yeah. But um, we would just say as uh, that God does preserve his word, and that as if he's preserved it this long, we should have great confidence that this is the canon. Um, which I think is the strongest argument. Yeah. Honestly. And so that that really is a way then from the New Testament we can often work our way back to the Old Testament, right? Yeah. So as far as quotes and stuff. Yeah, which is actually my next point. So um, we can so if we're gonna agree with the New Testament, we can look back and see where they quoted the Old Testament. So um, there was by one account, as Gruden points out, that the Jesus and disciples had quoted the Old Testament as authoritative over two hundred and ninety five times. And not once does it ever include the Apocrypha, so as you were pointing out. Yep. Um, which is really interesting because they even quote things like, like Jew quotes Enoch and Paul quotes the, the pagan Greeks. Well, so um, I will say about Enoch, it's debatable because the best sources we have for Enoch are post uh, Jew. <laughs> so yeah. um, there is like one maybe Ethiopian source. So it's debatable as to whether Jude is quoting Enoch or Enoch is quoting Jude. Yeah, so th yeah, there's even debate around that, but uh, as Grudem points out, that, that doesn't actually, like, even if they are right and uh, Jude is quoting Enoch, it could be just as Paul quoting the pagan Greeks, right? He's not saying that this is authoritative, they're using them as examples. Um, and specifically, they never use uh, qualifiers, like as it is written, or scripture. So, um, in these cases, I mean, it's just it's a bad argument that the Catholics are out there. And the point why so. this is so important is like we can, we're seeing like never before where norms are being questioned and, and twisted yeah. so yeah. quickly in our society that and a lot of people are getting caught up with it that having that confidence that these are some scholars for thousands of years who have agreed upon like you need yeah, that yeah. history to yeah. back up 
that to be able to stand with confidence against a world that's like quickly going bizarro, but yeah. you just kind of tune everything out and, and say like, my confidence is this, not wacky world. Yeah. yeah, well that's like, I, that, I started off the class by kind of saying that, that too. That authority is useful, but it is a bit of a catch-22, particularly when it comes to Catholic kin, because that is the main reason why Catholics have the Apocrypha in their canon is because the Catholic Church says so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I'll I'll get into that too. But um. So so the real question then, for so I mean to take a big picture on this, the the Apocrypha, as Cal pointed out, have always been contentious, right? It's not like there weren't people arguing about this. <laughs> so and every if we're going to include these as Christians, these are the only people we care about. We don't necessarily care about the secular. Um, atheists or any other religion saying what should be included in the Bible or not. Yeah, so exactly. if we take it just that and look at the Apocrypha from its merits, as I'm already starting to go through, this argument is really kind of easy for the Protestants to get through. Yeah. So, um, Particularly the argument that Jews from Jesus' time, that Jesus would not have considered the Apocrypha to be inspired. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and then, so, but then the question comes, so as Kyle pointed out, that's the best argument for it, but then we should ask why. Like, why is it included today? Um, as Kyle already talked about with Drum and the Vulgate, so Drum wrote the first widely used Latin uh, translation of the Bible called the Vulgate, mm -hmm. and um, Drum included in there the Apocrypha, but as Kyle also pointed out, he actually wrote in that that this was not inspired scripture in the, <laughs> in the start. Um, well, so he didn't say it's not inspired scripture. He said the Hebrews don't believe the Hebrews don't inspired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of his, his way. Yeah, so I, I believe, so around that time, around the time of Augustine, mm -hmm. um, lots of people were being branded heretics mm -hmm. <laughs> for yeah. potentially, for things that we might not even consider very contentious. And uh, mm -hmm. Jerome was pressured by Augustine to include them from the Septuagint, and I think mm -hmm. he didn't want to push it further. He was like, okay, yeah, maybe I shouldn't, lest this guy decide to brand me a heretic. And it's funny, for as much correspondence as we have between Augustine and Jerome, they never once met in person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which uh, is very interesting. So it, yeah, there's, there's some good reasons to believe that Jerome was uh, maybe manhandled mm -hmm. into it. But. So, um, and then, so, so with those points too, there are a few different um, books that people have also contended with, which is specifically going to include Esther in the Old Testament mm -hmm. and Hebrews. Um, I'm not going to get into it for the sake of time, but Hebrews, really the best argument for it is um, that it's self-attesting, that when you read it as any Christian would, you find real truth in there. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's almost like it's saying, this is what the Old Testament says, right? and it's just explaining it a little bit. Right, So, because we can't necessarily prove that it was Paul that wrote it, and if we could, then it would be very easy to prove that in scripture, right? But um, I'm just going to leave that there for now. Hebrews is self-testing. Esther was thought about very early on in the church, but it was eventually accepted pretty quickly as the Jews had accepted it already, right? So um, that's an important one. Um, we can go to the next one. So um, the for the Protestant view of the Bible, oh, we already talked about Chrome, uh, these ones. Sorry, I'm down to here right now. Uh, there are actually historical and doctrinal inaccuracies within the Apocrypha. So that's a big one in itself. Yep. So Grudem points out that both in Judith and Tobit, there's historical inaccuracies, as Cal said. Um, and then there's also, depending on how you, you uh, use the words, or the, use the verses in the Apocrypha, that you can find justification for wrongdoing in the Apocrypha. You can also find salvation by works, which is a huge deal. Um, and then other errors such as um, finding authority outside of scripture itself, all right? So this is where politics comes into it, as it almost always seems to, to come into the doctrine within the church, is that the um, Apocrypha was accepted in the Council of Trent in 1545, which was right after the Reformation, and there was a direct response to the Reformation, right? So you gotta remember, Martin Luther comes in and just shakes up the world of Christendom and yeah. um, has all these radical beliefs such as like, uh, you know, faith-based salvation and these sorts of things. And the church really needed a way to solidify their authority of the church, right? To say that they can bring truth to the church and to have a work-based salvation. The Apocrypha had ways for them to 
justify these sorts of beliefs, right? Yeah. So it really, to me, it seems more political than anything, especially by the fact that it was accepted right or officially right after the Reformation. As, as Cal pointed out, it was contended with very early on in the church. So there was about three or four North African councils that were local, they weren't like big church councils, that did accept it. And coincidentally, Augustine was a North African um, saint, right? So Augustine would be included in that. Um, I've read his thesis, Big Worm, The City of God, and he... Uh, <laughs> That's a big one. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great one. He's, I, I really like Augustine, but yeah, he puts, he puts a lot of emphasis on this sort of the Apocrypha and these sorts of things. So um, I, don't agree with, I don't agree with a lot what uh, Augustine believed. So, um, so yeah. So, so a good way to think about this in conclusion that Grudem points out is that the, the Catholic Church doesn't actually think that these hold to the same level as the other books of the Bible do, as Cal pointed out. But this is the logical fallacy in itself because um, so think about it as counterfeit money. So let's say that in America someone brings a bunch of counterfeit money into circulation and then Joe Biden being the President of the United States and all the government says, okay, this counterfeit money is now real money. It doesn't actually <laughs> change the fact that the counterfeit money is counterfeit, right? No matter how much we want to accept it, yeah. it was not created in the way it was supposed to be created, right? Only God would have the ability to create that money to make it real money, not And heritage. to me, it just sounds right. really bizarre to say like, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it's like less inspired. Less, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, what does that mean? Yeah. So. I think that's a really good um, summary of kind of what they believe. But I, I think this is really the key point right here is the acceptance right after the Reformation and the fact that they were able to justify a lot of the beliefs by different verses that they have in the Apocrypha. So, um, and then another kind of last point is that Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament, um, ends with the expectation that the Messiah is going to come. And um, it just makes sense that if that was the expectation, that when we pick up canon again, it would be with the coming of the Messiah. Um, there is definitely continuity. Like, like Matthew. <laughs> like Matthew, yeah, right, like right when Matthew starts. So um, it seems a little bit weird that we would have Malachi and then seven other books of the Bible or whatever, five, the ones that will lie in there, um, and then Matthew. So um, just with all that evidence taken together, it seems overwhelming that the Apocrypha should not be included in, in the Old Testament. Yeah. So that's that. Are there any questions? Additional comments? I should have asked this at the beginning. I thought maybe it would come to me, but what exactly does canon mean? Oh, probably should have defined that. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> the idea I of... I came in late, of, so I was like, maybe that's the first thing. No, we missed that. <laughs> the idea of canon... Yeah, I didn't actually look up a real definition for okay. it, but the idea is a sort of canopy around scripture. So because these are all separate books, it's not so much, it, like, part of it is, okay, which books are included, included, <laughs> and which books are not included, are outside that sort of bubble, that sort of canopy. And the criteria of inspiration. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, a measuring stick is another good way of putting it. Yeah. The definition the, of the word, so we apply it to, like, scripture. Yeah. The Oxford Dictionary says a criterion in which you judge something, so, yeah. yeah. I was expecting an angry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's canon with one N, so you're not shooting anything. <laughs> um, and yeah, that I think is a is a really good summary. That um, just to throw up another point for why we don't believe in the apocrypha is inspired by God is because one of the issues of canon was okay if you said Paul wrote this, did he actually write this or not? Yeah. And so like with Judith and uh, Baruch and these other things, where clearly the people that they're testing authorship to could have wrote it. Mm -hmm. That's pseudepigraphical, so it's false. Uh, you know, authoring basically, and so it's it's lying about who the author is. Uh, so it's a great reason why we don't accept it. Mm -hmm. So like other books, like uh, the Gospel of Thomas, um, yeah. the Gospel of Peter, other things which like are that, purported to be in the New Testament. Yeah, we don't believe because the Gospel of Thomas could not possibly yep. have been written by Saint it's Thomas. It's the same type of idea there. Yep. Huh. And uh, yeah, so that yeah, that is a good way to codify what I said earlier. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so generally, as far as what we see, we start with the New Testament, and we go, okay, so what does the New Testament attest about the Old Testament? And we see that very clearly with most of the Old Testament. And then additionally, as far as the slightly more contentious ones, we see, okay, what do the Jews at Jesus' time believe about that? And does this t change what we believe about the New Testament? Because if it does, we can't have it. <laughs> we believe the New Testament first, and then we believe the Old Testament. So...
There's some interesting verses in Maccabees that talk about giving alms for the dead. Oh, yeah. Um, giving prayers for the dead, other sorts of stuff like that, where yeah. you can affect those in the afterlife through your earthly actions. So, like purgatory, those types of things, a few of the Catholic doctrines that they believe in, where it's like, where are you getting this from? It's like, oh, well, you know, we got it from the pocket. Stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There are, yeah, for sure. I grew to that that was actually one of the main ones why they accepted the pocket. Yeah. Prayer for the dead was a huge deal for Luther, apparently. Um, so. Oh, interesting. Well, because Luther got rid of most of the apocryphal. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. That's why they accepted it. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Well, thank you for coming out. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Whoops.